Welcome to Santa Barbara Talks with Josh Molina. It's my pleasure today to be here with two individuals who I've gotten to know in the last few weeks because I've been writing about this issue that they have been leaders on. They formed a group called TechWise. And this conversation is going to be about everything that they're doing to help educate the public on these really important issues of technology and technology in the hands of students, the youngest students that we have in our district. We are obviously coming out of the pandemic. During the pandemic, everything had to go to remote and school districts had to issue iPads and technology and devices to students. And obviously that was a great thing because we needed to continue school. But now that we're coming out of the pandemic, my two guests today have been instrumental and they have a whole network of people behind them. They've been instrumental in really trying to say, hey, let's talk now about what's best for our students and do we really want them to have access to technology as we're coming out of the pandemic? And we're not just talking here, we're dealing with two experts. So I wanna introduce you, Dr. Kristen Hughes, who's a pediatrician with the Santa Barbara County Public Health Department and Melissa Quigley um, at Monroe School. So you deal with uh, students on a firsthand basis. Mm -hmm. So thank you for taking the time to be on my show, Melissa and Kristen. And uh, why don't we just start right off with what you've been working on. Um, you formed this group TechWise. What's the issue? What's the problem? Go ahead. Hi, Josh. Thanks so much for having us here um, mm -hmm. and taking the time for us to be able to share our uh, experiences as uh, both pediatrician and school psychologist and what we've been seeing. Um, my passion is for children and the health and well-being of children. And I am so uh, grateful to be able to work for the Santa Barbara Public Health Department where I work in uh, the county clinic, uh, the Franklin Healthcare Center on the east side where we serve our least resourced families in our community. Um, it's a great privilege and I um, take my work there very seriously. And um, I, during the pandemic, unfortunately came across family after family that was struggling with the challenges of the new tech um, that had entered their homes and from um, the problems they were finding coming out of that. Um, many families were reporting to me um, it, that they were worried about their children, especially very young children, because now we're, we're talking about four-year-olds who um, had never had access to the internet and a, and a tablet, now having hours and hours um, a day where they were on, on in front of screens. And their parents came to me um, during well child check appointments, but also um, during sick appointments, sharing with me their concerns about the changes they were seeing in their children. And um, they said that they were concerned that at least some of those effects were coming directly from the excessive screen time. And so I, it, it really tipped me off to this as a pediatrician to, to listen to my families, hear what they're telling me, and start investigating it myself and, and looking into it. So um, I, I started um, checking every child's screen time when they would come in um, on their devices. There's a, a, there was a you know, setting on, on your handheld device where you can check. And I, I was seeing over the last few years, this dramatic tr um, increased trend in the number of daily average hour of screen time for, for kids and the age at which it starts was getting lower and lower. At the same time, I was seeing disturbing trends in um, conditions that were uh, pre-existent to the pandemic, like pediatric obesity, but that now the numbers were rising rapidly and the degree of the disease was worse. We were seeing many more kids with morbid obesity and we were seeing it happening at younger and younger ages. And unfortunately with that condition, there's a lot of other, um, we call them comorbid conditions or other conditions that go along with that. Things like hypertension, high cholesterol, fatty liver, um, heart disease, diabetes. And we, I saw trends in all of these um, conditions going up. So it was alarming to me. Um, 
So that's really where my interest started. And then my own children. So I'm also a parent. I have two kids. My son was in kindergarten when um, the pandemic started and had to quickly, they call it the pivotal change, you know, to remote learning. And we all understand we, we had to do it at the time that the schools were mandated to close and the, the students needed access to learn. So we don't, um, you know, we don't um, find any blame there. I mean, we had to do what we had to do. Um, but um, I saw changes in my son. He's a sweet boy, but I started to see him becoming aggressive when I tried to remove the tablet from him, hiding it from me, being shameful when he got caught. Um, and I just saw these changes building up over time. And as a parent, those were some red flags to me too, um, that I was seeing some behavioral changes as well. And Research is showing, yes, that actually increased screen time can add to aggression and ADHD-like symptoms, anxiety and depression. And so, yes, um, I was experiencing some of that to a degree in my own home with my own children. So I understand where parents are coming from. And so that made me um, look into these uh, the school-issued tablets more and more to try and find out where the issues were in terms of why the kids were, were so interested in being on them all the time. And that just kind of led us down this path. Um, and um, yeah, so we can go, go into that in more detail, but, but that's how we got started. It really started from a medical um, concern yeah. and um, went from there. Yeah, and I want to go to Melissa in a second, but just to add a little bit to that is I'm, I have a second grade daughter and I, right, she was in kindergarten right during the pandemic also. So similar situation. And all of a sudden, the classes are on Zoom. And then, you know, and, and where I live, Galita, they, they did, you know, a year of, of, of Zoom at school. And it's just such a different experience, not even in my experience, talking about after school or those other times but learning through technology is is a barrier I mean I know that it is something that allows us to learn different types of things but I remember you know if you're in a classroom and you raise your hand the teacher can see you okay and on zoom they tell you to raise your hand and so they're raising their hand <laughs> but then they're also teaching them about the virtual hand mm -hmm. and then if you don't get seen in that sort of moment it's uh it's frustrating you know and yeah. so these children have had to learn technology at much mm -hmm. earlier ages some cases against their will than the natural sort of progression of when they should be learning that on their on their own so I have a you know, similar experience, you know, to what, to what you're, you're dealing with to some degree, Melissa, uh, thanks so much for Thank being you. on the show and to both of you to have this kind of access, authentic conversation about a real issue. Can you talk to me about what you're seeing, Melissa? Sure, sure. Um, thank you, Josh, again, for having us. It's It's been a long road. We started in March, probably, right, Kristen, probably March, 2022, uh, and this has been a, a day in and day out endeavor we've all been on, and there's more than just the two of us involved. And um, this, it's been exhilarating and exhausting and stressful, and there's lots of ups and downs to making change happen. And so we really appreciate your support and the, this avenue to talk more about it. Um, and we are very passionate about this. So thank you for having us. Yes. Um, and so I'm a school psychologist with Santa Barbara Unified. I'm at Monroe School. In the past, school psychologists were assigned more than one school. Uh, the last few years, elementary school psychologists are at one site. So I'm at solely Monroe School. And my job, and, and I'll also back up, in the past, school psychologists' jobs were mm, confined pretty much to the special education side of things where we were really working with the most at risk, at risk students in terms of whether they have a disability or not and whether they're really struggling social, emotionally or behaviorally or um, academically. In recent years, coinciding with the pandemic, we are at one school and we are also expected to work on the preventative side of things and the general education side of things. So right now I'm 
I am working um, very heavily with special education and assessing children's to see if they qualify for special education. But I'm also working with teachers and a lot of site teams and site committees on um, bigger picture things um, and a lot of the interventions that we have for children. Um, so from my perspective, what I'm seeing in school related to technology, um, coming back from the pandemic is really interesting. The amount of technology used in school, and I'm not just speaking about my school, but in general, um, technology has stayed uh, pretty, I don't know if the word, word is heavy, but, but pretty consistent. It's being used in classrooms. And I would say that is different than before the pandemic. Um, the teachers do have a lot of great new skills. They, they have honed in on integrating technology and using technology to find resources more now than they did prior to the pandemic. Um, but what I'm seeing is the attention. That's one of the big things. So children are struggling to pay attention in school. And a lot of it is, is very likely related to the pandemic because paying attention on Zoom was really difficult. Um, so how do you pay attention to your teacher, you know, six hours a day or three hours a day in chunks or however it looks? Um, that's just really hard to pay attention in general and to pay attention to a screen. But now children are back in school and they're expected to pay attention to their teacher, but there's devices integrated into the classrooms. So just one example is if a teacher is teaching and they're mirroring something on the Apple TV and then they're children are asked to get out their devices and follow along or open up a document and start, you know, doing something on a document. Kids are expert swipers. And so they're swiping all over the place and they're swiping faster than I can ever swipe. And they're on the document they're supposed to be on, but they're very quickly navigating to other apps or to the camera or to a drawing app or to a game or to messaging each other. There's a, there's a lot of off task behavior going on. And so one of my concerns is not just the actual attention that a student is paying um, to the task or the teacher, but the amount of attention they're paying to the device and to what they can access on the device. Um, so I would say as a school psychologist and just as a, in general, as a person that works in a school, um, that is a major concern. Um, as a school psychologist, there's, again, there's a ton of concern about the mental health fallout right now. Um, so the amount of um, anxiety and depression that's going on, even among the little kids, is staggering. And the amount of suicide ideation and the amount of, you know, low self-esteem that's being seen, a lot of it is connected to what's happening on devices, not necessarily what's happening in school on devices, um, not, at least in the elementary school, but what's happening outside of school and kids are making connections through technology. Um, kids are excluding each other through technology. Um, when schools allow technology like cell phones or tablets to be used throughout the school day, um, there is social media things going on. There are things that are being captured on camera and on film. There, there is that uh, negative peer interaction that, that might be happening at home or on a game but is carrying over into the school setting. And that's con directly contributing to anxiety about coming to school, anxiety about getting together with friends, um, all of it. And the amount of kids struggling with depression um, and whether or not it's a diagnosable depression, it's characteristics of depression. So kids that are more likely to be withdrawing from others, um, isolating, um, that those are major concerns. Um, the, the piece about sleep and kids that seem tired and fatigued at school, teachers are really reporting a lot of um, concern with kids being tired. And that is also directly related to screen time. Because when you ask the child about it or the parent about it, there's oftentimes a very direct link to the amount of times kids are using their, um, you know, their, a, a device at home and how that's interfering with their bedtime routine and their sleep routine. So those are some of the concerns I have as a school psychologist. When you talk about these issues of uh, suicide ideation, how early are you seeing it? I mean, you teach at elementary school and it's, it's yeah. just yeah. mind boggling to think that a, a child who has mm -hmm. their whole life ahead of them and mm -hmm. so much potential would already be having these mm -hmm. feelings. 
Um, how early do you see it? In our uh, school district, we've had um, down to kindergartners and fourth graders mm -hmm. um, experiencing these kinds of things this year. Yeah. Um, and so it, it is getting earlier and earlier. Yeah. I'm so it, it, it looks like there's, there's two components here. There's a physical side uh, in terms of what overuse of devices does to children and all of the physical health effects. Mm -hmm. But there's also a, a, a mental and emotional mm -hmm. uh, side of it. And there's an impact. And so you, you both sort of, sort of mm -hmm. see that. Talk yeah, to me about, sorry, go sorry. ahead. Would yeah. it be okay? Uh, Melissa, what, something you said got me thinking of a story. I just heard this week, I had a teenager come in and the chief complaint was concussion. So I thought, okay concussion and she came in and her story to me was that she had gotten beat up at school and she had gotten hit in the head by another student and um, I was worried about her concussion and, and she was most concerned about the fact not that she had gotten hurt but that it had been captured on people's cell mm -hmm. phones videos mm -hmm. and she was reliving it over and over mm -hmm. again and um, that the, that was being sent out to everybody and everybody was seeing she got beat up. And I just, I just didn't even think about that, you know, yeah. aspect. It's, it's hard enough to go to school. It's hard enough to have a bully. It's hard enough to get beat up and have the physical injury, mm -hmm. but then to have that whole mm -hmm. added element of how tech has amplified mm -hmm. the traumatic event she right. went through is right. just one example. And that, that was right. just something coming in for a concussion. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, when I went to school, you, you might be worried about, um, you know, what am I wearing today? What do I look like? Mm -hmm. uh, but you get through the day and then you're on to the next day. Mm -hmm. But with technology, mm -hmm. people can watch it over and over. Mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. you might be feeling better yourself the next mm -hmm. day, but then you hear other people have seen this, you know, video that you've seen yeah. and it ruins your, your day again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You two have been really effective working with the Santa Barbara Unified School District because you started bringing this attention up, mm -hmm. uh, as you said, in March, uh, in public comment, during public comment, mm -hmm. being very um, kind, respectful, like collaborative sort of attitude. But you also did your research. You brought pediatricians into the room and parents and people who had expertise. And mm -hmm. your goal was to say, let's take back the iPads mm -hmm. for the youngest mm -hmm. students because they probably don't need them as much. And let's also look at what they have access to on campus, mm -hmm. YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, what are they using YouTube for? Where are we at with the school district? I, I know you've had a lot of success and progress mm -hmm. right now. Can you bring us up to speed on the reaction that they've given to you on this issue? Well, thank you, Josh, for mentioning um, the, the pediatricians. So um, yes, this started um, with, with a single pediatrician. However, <laughs> it, we would never have ever gotten um, as far as we have without the tremendous um, support of all of our local pediatricians. We have mm -hmm. over 40 pediatricians or, and pediatric specialists who have signed mm -hmm. our letter to the school district and another um, over 40 mental health providers who have signed our letter. So um, I, I mentioned it at one of the board meetings that um, that's over 300 years of postgraduate education dedicated to, solely to the health and well-being of children mm -hmm. in just the MDs alone. And that's not mm -hmm. adding their years and years of clinical mm -hmm. practice experience. So, yeah, it's not just me. We're coming with a wealth of knowledge. And um, so we are so grateful to our a wonderful community mm -hmm. of pediatricians and mental health specialists who have taken the time to um, add their voices and their own experiences to this. Um, so yes, um, it's been definitely a collaborative where gra we've been grassroots all along, mm -hmm. um, yep. <laughs> but we have that um, expertise also to support it. And the really wonderful thing we've seen come out of this is as the, um, the doctors and the mental health providers have um, informing people of the issues, we have been seeing uh, parents, teachers, um, administrators, and IT experts um, come out from the woodworks mm -hmm. and join us. And so, um, mm -hmm. I mean, we're not IT experts um, to say the least. Um, mm -hmm. I think we still struggle with Zoom meetings and um, such, <laughs> but we now have, <laughs> yeah, we now have a group, a wonderful group mm -hmm. of IT um, experts from Microsoft, um, 
um, some that advise NASA and um, private companies that have partnered with us. And they're also mm -hmm. talking, um, helping us talk with the school district mm -hmm. and find solutions. Um, so we're really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I will say, I just want to add while well, Kristen's on that, um, be partially because of the media coverage and your support, uh, Josh, with some of these articles, we had teachers and parents come out of the woodwork and approach us and say, thank you for saying something. I was concerned what technology looked like in my classroom, but I didn't know how to say anything about it. Thank you. How can I join? I had teachers running across the campus where I work saying, that was great. Thank you so much for saying something and being brave enough to stand up for all of us. So it was really just wonderful to have the kind of the boost from, from news Hawk and from you. So we do yeah. appreciate that. Well, well thank you. I, it was, it's from a reporter's perspective, people grumble all the times to reporters, you know, this mm -hmm. is bad, this is wrong, but they don't do anything more than grumbling. And so what was impressive with you and your organization is you could very easily do your job and go home and live your life and well, who cares, right? You're, you're do probably doing relatively well, but you didn't do that. You're saying, hey, I, I care about what I do and I want to mm -hmm. help people. So let's go public with it. And that's just a good trait. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people do that. Well, it's, e it's easier to you. just complain. Yeah. Hey, I want to ask you about uh, tech equity, okay? Because the school district removed the iPads, I think, for kindergartners, K through two, a little bit early in the, in the year, school year. So what, what does that mean? That means that we do have households that probably don't have enough money to, to buy an $800 iPad or whatever they, they cost these days. Mm -hmm. And there are good uses for them, as we know. Um, they exist and they have good, mm -hmm. good um, purpose if used appropriately. But can you talk to me about this situation where you could have families who can't afford this kind of technology and then other families who do, and is that a barrier to education down the road when they start to have to use technology in the classroom? Yeah, thanks, Josh, for bringing that up. Um, yeah, our group has been clear from the beginning, we're not anti-tech. Um, we understand and appreciate that tech has the ability to have very transformative um, impacts on individuals and families. And we are, we are pro transformative tech um, that, that can change lives. Um, but we have to live in reality. And reality is that there's also very distracting tech and consumer tech. And there's a whole industry of tech that makes a lot of money um, developing tech that's geared um, towards um, a, a addicting our kids to their product um, and that um, in that way giving more of that type of tech is what I'm seeing is causing a health um, disparity a greater health disparity because unfortunately a lot of the least resourced families are going to fall um, more prey to this because um, it requires a very um, a very active in-home parenting um, resource to keep um, the tech in check. Mm -hmm. Like Melissa mentioned, the school tablets are just two swipes away from your Lexia Dreambox <laughs> to your endless hours of YouTube. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. even in my own home, I'm, you know, I'm very um, conscious of this issue, but my kid would be across the, the table from me and mm -hmm. could be off, off task in a second. So if I wasn't eyeballs on the screen, I wouldn't necessarily even know. And one of our concerns with the school issue tablets is that they, it, they disabled the screen time monitoring feature. Mm -hmm. And so that's um, a, a key pillar of the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations are that parents track their children's screen time so they know just how many hours a day they are in front of a screen. And with that feature disabled on the school tablets, parents who are working parents, when they get home, they don't necessarily know not just how long their kid was on, but what the child was doing. They might think it was um, potentially all educational. They were um, 
told to parents to be um, helping with, um, you know, English as a second language learner. So a parent might even think, oh, this can help my child with their English skills and their reading skills, but not knowing that they were off task and on something. Um, they, there is also iTunes um, on, on the school tablet. So there's endless hours of um, entertainment for children. And um, as a pediatrician, this concerns me because every single hour spent on a screen is one hour that a child is displaced from activities that are healthy for them. Things like physical exercise. Um, I've been, I've been, I created a project at our clinic called Project Play to try and get kids active again after the pandemic. Um, but kids don't even want to engage in it because they're so more interested on being at home on their screens in their rooms. Um, and, um, so, so physical exercise is one of the key um, activities that has been displaced by screen time. And um, also sleep is a major issue. Um, we're seeing um, record rates of insomnia um, for children who are um, on their screens or gaming it, into the wee hours of the morning and then all the behavioral issues that come out of children um, who are sleep deprived. Um, and family time. A lot of my uh, families come from um, a, his, um, a Hispanic back uh, heritage, and um, really value you know value highly the, the meal time. And um, and now screens have even come into that, and um, people are on screens around the kitchen table. And parents have um, told me that that concerns them. They they they're not hearing um, much from their kids. Um, national data is showing that tween, um, tweens are on their screens five to six hours a day outside of school. And teens are on their screens eight to 12 hours outside of school. The average teenage boy only talks to their dad 30 minutes a week. So these, you know, we're, we're finding that um, there's real um, problems coming out of um, what seems like just these small little incremental changes over, you know, over days and weeks, they actually add up and become big problems for their kids' health. And on yeah. that, um, back to that tech equity uh, issue, I think what Kristen was also saying is that some of these concerns that she's seeing are higher concerns among the Hispanic community or the Latinx community. So these concerns are more prevalent in her clinic among a specific demographic of children. And so that is an equity issue. I mean, if we're concerned about equity, we are seeing higher screen time effects among some children than other children. And that was another point that we had in our advocacy as well. Um, and to speak on the idea of how to support parents moving forward if devices are removed from children. We gave the suggestion to the school district. It sounds like they're going to take it on and we're not quite sure how it's going to roll out, but we did give that suggestion to the school district to offer devices to parents and offer a way for parents to check it out. Um, I did see briefly a Google form that was created by our district mm -hmm. and was given out to um, parents. And so, um, you know, with the option of, of checking out an iPad for the parent, mm. what yeah, we would like to see, <laughs> yes, what we would like to see is at TechWise is that that process improve. So the idea of if a device, a, a device is going to get checked out to a parent, ideally, the parent would receive very direct support and education on what that device is intended to be for, how to implement all the protective settings at the home setting, um, how to, you know, and, and also informing parents of the risks of tech use at home and, um, you know, giving them a little bit more tools. And so it does sound like our school district is in the process of creating a plan to support parents in that area. What I'm not positive if it's happening yet or, or kind of what's happening in the immediate is the, the TK through third grade iPads. Uh, it, it seems like they are moving to classroom-based sets next year. We've heard that. It was in the board meeting. So there is a very positive change, and that's a huge action step that our group has advocated for and that the district has listened and is actually making a, an immediate change. Um, what, what I'm hoping is that there's a clear break of 
the one-to-one -one iPads stop and then iPads are turned in. And then there's a new process in the future for parents checking them out rather than just one-to-one -one iPads, you know, rolling into the, the parents' hands. Um, and so I, I don't know what that looks like. I haven't personally or professionally been informed on some of these details, um, but, but addressing that tech equity issue, that was one of our suggestions and solutions is if a parent needs an iPad to survive in this tech world, then, then let's offer it. Let's have a very particular system to do it. Let's inform parents of it. Let's help them set up monitoring tools. And uh, it sounds like Mauricio Ortega, our ETS director, is going to work on filtering systems for home settings. So, I mean, that is that's the best strategy that we can come up with at the moment. Um, but it seems like a good strategy because if we're concerned about our parents and they need it, then there's a way for them to get it um, without giving it to the kid, without it turning into a recreational um, addictive experience in the home. Yeah. yeah. Questions on tech um, equity are are rampant in our community right now. Um, I mean, this is what society we're, we're talking about right now. We're trying to have these discussions. What does tech equity really mean? And I, I've attended a few community events and mm -hmm. um, um, I've heard things um, stated that part of tech equity is uh, getting everybody broadband high speed internet access and every home a device. Um, and um, while those are parts of tech equity, I think it's a little oversimplification of a very complex problem that really needs to be more nuanced. Um, and I, at these community events, I would hear all the promises of what this, um, this intervention is going to provide um, the families. Um, uh, and one of them, a doctor on the panel, saying um, this is vital for the health and well-being of children because now they will have access to telehealth appointments. And I, I sat there and, and thought to myself, I would really like to meet this magical pediatrician who is somehow going to undo all the adverse effects of the children being on screens five to six hours a day in some 15 minute telehealth appointment, because I know I don't, I can't do that. Um, and, and I think so it, it, it needs to be more um, nuanced. It needs to be understood of what really happens when this type of tech enters into a home. Um, and I hear that story day in and day out. In fact, a mom just shared with me on Friday that her um, eight-year-old daughter um, who um, went on remote, you know, remote learning, like we all had to do with the pandemic, um, became um, highly, highly addicted to her tablet. And um, I hadn't seen her um, for a bit. And when she came in, I was, I was really quite surprised. She had gained a lot of weight and um, she, in the clinic, we can do a finger stick and she, um, had um, developed di pre-diabetes uh, in, in over two years. She went from a healthy girl, healthy eight-year-old girl, healthy, healthy and happy. Two years later, um, she's obese and has pre-diabetes and she's anxious and sad. And um, the mom was just like distraught when I told her her daughter at eight years old has pre-diabetes. So I asked the mom, what, what's been going on in, in, in her life these last two years? And the mom shared with me, she's a single mom. Um, she's a working mom. She's got two kids and that um, her, she, she didn't know how much her daughter was on the tablet and they live, they rent a room in a home. Like so many families um, that I serve, they live in um, homes that are shared by multiple families. And the struggle was when the mom got home from work, if she tried to separate her daughter from her tablet, her daughter would throw a, a fit mm -hmm. and it would be so disruptive to the home that her, um, the, the other families um, threatened to evict her. So she was facing a decision mm -hmm. of, do I keep a roof over my kids heads and let my daughter, you know, continue in this, uh, this behavior and this addiction to this tablet, or do I really try to um, make a change? And so she came to the clinic asking for advice and help on how we could, um, you know, help her daughter. And this is, these are, these are stories I hear from parents every single day in my clinic. My, my teenage son has a gaming, um, an internet gaming addiction, and he won't go back to school and he's up till two in the morning. Um, and there's a whole nother aspect of this. That's a very real aspect, which is the sextortion. Um, 
I don't, yeah, I don't know if you've heard much about it, but um, there, there's, yeah, there's a um, nonprofit and global leader in fighting online child sexual abuse called Thorn. And in 2020, over 60 million images and videos of children um, with sexual abuse material were reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They report in their research that one out of five, nine to 12 year olds were surveyed and um, admitted to having an online sexual interaction with someone they believed to be an adult. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so this is a whole nother um, mm -hmm. aspect of the health and well-being of kids that we need to be aware of. And this is something that my patients do report to me the, of um, being asked to give um, self nudes on the internet to someone they believe to be an adult. So um, it really, it, it's reality. And so mm -hmm. when we go to these community discussions about tech equity, we really have to understand all the, the various aspects of it. And we can't just go with all the promises without discussing these types of perils. And in large part, we might be trading um, one set of problems for another mm -hmm. set of problems. We've done this massive experiment with the school district, mm -hmm. giving every kid um, who needed it a hotspot that goes with them 24 seven backpack mm -hmm. on the bus, on the playground, on the after school program, hotspot. You can access your tablet anywhere mm -hmm. um, and at any time. And um, we did not see a healthier, happier community of kids afterwards. We saw mm -hmm. sad mm -hmm. and sick more more sad and sick kids and so we should learn from that yeah um it's a couple of things i have a, a 16 year old and an eight year old okay so i sort of see the two different <laughs> different age groups and <laughs> oh, you know where i think maybe maybe melissa is not guilty of this i don't know she seems pretty <laughs> much on it but i know i'm guilty of it um i pick up my daughter from school mm -hmm. and she gets off at 250 and i still have a couple hours of work to do so there's tv time right like okay you can do your homework get some tv time i'll finish up my work you know and mm -hmm. and so there's we all do that right we all use technology some of us you know most of us all of us if we're being honest as a babysitter from time to time mm -hmm. and uh that's every parent's decision to you know to do that and to regulate that but it is time where they're not doing something else mm -hmm. or even just learning how to independent play, just role play. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, right. I always, right. always tell this to my kids, like, like, you know, when I was your age, I had to think <laughs> and they always <laughs> laugh at me. Like I literally, if I was bored or depressed right. or just not happy, I would just <laughs> have to, like stew in right. it and come out of it. Right. And, and yes. I'm sure that's probably insensitive, but that was what I did. Okay. That was me. I'm not saying other people have to do that. I, and now we're just so quick to be like, what's, mm -hmm. let me check now. Yeah. You know, let me look. And yeah. that's, that's something that everyone sort of has to deal mm -hmm. with. I, I teach uh, two campuses. I teach at CSUN and Santa Barbara city college and I teach mm -hmm. journalism and I have to tell you, it doesn't get better. Mm -mm. <laughs> um, no, it gets worse because mm -hmm. I have to play parent sometimes in the classroom, like mm -hmm. put your technology away, put your iPhone away. I can't mm -hmm. see what you're working on. Right. Um, and even in college though, there's, there's more reason for them to have technology. But really what I have found is that people go to the device mm -hmm. when they're bored or, and that mm -hmm. goes to the attention span. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what is the, it, it's like seconds now before we have to like look right. for more gratification. So that's a really tough thing to sort of like put mm -hmm. back, you know, in the box and sort of in the back yeah. of the bottle. And like, how do we, mm -hmm. how do we unravel that? I want to ask your opinion of this because this is one thing I try to do with a little thing in my world is when I'm around my kids to not be like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk yeah. about the role of parents and just modeling good behavior? Because I'm one of those parents, I have to admit, that when I'm or in our social circles, I'm a, I judge, right? I'm like, how can you complain about your kid when you're sitting there doing the same thing? Okay, so can you talk a little about modeling good behavior for parents? And if you're on your device, well, of course your kid's going to be on their device. Right. I'll, I'll take this one to start with, Kristen. Um, this, is, this is a perfect question, Josh, because what I did want to communicate to any listeners is that I we, all of us are recognizing 
that we all use technology and there's room for improvement at the personal level for all of us. And also we don't, it's easy to judge someone else and to be like, oh, I'm glad I don't do that. But then, you know, when you're in your home or you're in your car, like we all do our own thing. So I think we have to allow everyone to, to come at their own kind of revelation and reflection at their own pace and to also give parents and families room to be individual because what one family decides is okay is going to be different than another family. And, and we need to acknowledge like, that's okay. We're, we're all allowed to, um, you know, to have our different tech values. Um, and, and that said, I love that you brought this up because it's so true. Exactly what we do is what our kids are going to learn. So it does start with us. And Kristen said this in a, a board meeting at one point that we are stewards of technology and what we do is the role model. So I am very aware of what I do. And I'm very aware of when I come home, like you do, Josh, and I still have things to do. I'm very aware of the level of frustration I have that I just need to finish an email. I just need to do one more thing. Like I'm mid this, can you guys just be quiet? And for me, um, I've, I've tried to say it out loud to just explain to our kids. And I have a one and a half year old, almost two and a five year old. And I try to just say out loud, I need to be on my phone. I need to be on my computer. This is what I'm doing. And when I'm done, I'll turn it off. Um, and so just speaking out loud and admitting what I'm doing is very helpful. Um, but full disclosure are my husband and I just instigated a rule in our house that there's no phones in the bathroom because that was like the place where you could go and hide and get your emails checked. Um, so full disclosure, as of, you know, whatever today is March, I don't know, 28th, maybe as of March 23rd, there's no phones in our bathroom. And that is one way for us to model. Like we don't need our phone attached to us in a pocket yeah. everywhere we go because we can't like, and, and sometimes I find myself putting on leggings and I'm like, oh, it's the legging without the phone pouch. Now, how am I going to hold my phone? And it's like, you know what? I don't need to go to the park with my phone today. It's fine. Mm -hmm. So it's also that, you know, just recognition of if we can distance ourselves from our devices a little bit, um, this is going to be a good role model for our kids. And if we can have the honest conversations of just like, you know, screens are a part of our life, but let's make a really good decision about when we turn on our phone and when we turn it off. You know, all of these are good talking points for children. Um, but again, it takes a teacher, it takes a principal, it takes a doctor, it takes a parent, it, it takes all of us to start modeling it as our, you know, in our own ways, in our own places. Um, and that's why I think TechWise SB is so important because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, to bring it back to this is a community. Yes, the school district has a huge role to play in it right now because there's thousands and thousands and thousands of children that are accessing devices and are using screens all during the school day. So yes, absolutely, the school district needs to be part of this, but it is a parent responsibility and it is a community responsibility. And also, and I'd like to say this too, as a parent, if you're going to tell your child they can't have a phone until they're X amount of years old, or if they can't do a certain thing on a device, you want to have other parents and other friends that you can partner with and you can have your own community with because it's easier to raise children with a certain tech value if you have someone else in your support system doing the same thing, if they have another friend that's willing to do the same thing. Um, and so hopefully our school district, our community tech wise, um, you know, we can implement some screen free strategies or, you know, there's a, there's a, Let's see, Screenagers movie has a way for the day. It's a, another um, strategy of putting your phone away for the day. There's a lot of um, pledges out there. There's a lot of motivations out there to, to create more distance mm -hmm. from a device, a personal device. Um, and if we can support our children to creating more distance, we're also going to support them in delaying that, you know, that, that one-to-one -one relationship that we all have where we can't leave the house without our phone we can't go to work without our phone we can't go to the playground without our phone we can't we can't have a fun adventure without taking selfies of ourselves like like we need distance with our devices um and so we all have to start somewhere yeah. and so i think it's just a really good place to be as a community where we're talking about it yeah, yeah. go ahead kristen mm -hmm. when um 
one thing we've been kind of doing in our clinic is um, we have appointments we call healthy habits appointments. Um, these are for primarily kids who are struggling with um, obesity, but we check in um, on a regular basis and we go over ideas together. We partner um, with parents and patient and um, the doctor about healthy habits. And um, with all this um, information we're getting about screens, um, that has now become a regular part of the discussion that I have with families on establishing healthy habits. And um, so routinely, one of the goals we set is we try to set a goal to reduce their screen hour, their screen use by one hour per day. And then we say, what could we do with that extra hour? And um, inevitably it ends up being, we can be physically active. We can go outside, we can play with our friends, but we can move our bodies. And it's like in that moment of silence where we ask the, 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 the child, what could we do? They think, you know, they're thinking. Um, and that's great. It's giving them an opportunity like, wow, an hour. What would I do with an hour? And, um, and to, to remind them that there's an opportunity to be, to be active and, and how important that is for their health. And so swapping out that one hour to start out with has been a good first step for a lot of our families. Yeah, that's good. Uh, setting, setting small goals and building up to mm -hmm. it. You can't say no devices by tomorrow, right? You have to mm -hmm. build up to it and it's much easier to, to make gains that way. You know, it's, it's a tough thing because Really, I think we use our, you know, children use their devices to connect to something bigger than themselves. Um, you know, they, if they feel if, if they're alone, if they're not something that other people are, they can use that device to feel connected to a greater group. And it's an artificial connection. It's not a real connection. And I think that's really the, 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 the sadder part of the situation is that the technology makes people feel good about themselves in an artificial way, but it's much better than for them feeling alone or isolated. And the, 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 the sickening part of it too, is actually will make you feel more isolated in the long run, but it gives you that, that instant gratification. Um, you know, it's like, if you're on social, if you're a kid on social media, you feel like you are a famous, right? Like, look, I have a platform. I, I look at, I have followers and right, I'm, I'm right. somebody that right. is important. Whereas mm -hmm. at least, you know, for, for me, when I was, you know, we didn't have that at that age and you aspired, you know, you couldn't just go on your phone and be a selfie and be like, look at me now I'm famous. And so I think that's the sadder part is just that iPhone <laughs> really revolutionized everything that we did and then you know the ipad because we now um feel like we are part of things we're really not okay like if i have x amount of followers i'm important but you're really not you're not important um it's just that you're kind of the cool thing at the moment to listen to you have to you know children have to feel as though it's okay to be alone it's okay to be by yourself it's okay to be individual and uh, that's that's the toughest part is is it's can I ask you about television you know when I was growing up it's like don't watch too much television um now with my kids it's like stay off your ipad or, or your right, right, iphone right, right. I think I know the answer to this but is television better because at least it's in a room you can see what they're seeing right. a bigger screen I mean, do you have any thoughts on the role of television versus the iPad or the iPhone? Yeah, actually. Yeah, television's different. <laughs> yeah, you probably could speak to this too, but I know as far as recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, co-viewing um, is more highly recommended than just viewing in isolation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still not as ideal as doing an interactive activity with your child, but co-viewing allows the parent to... Um, see what the child is um, viewing. And then if they see that the child is having a reaction, they can pause it and they can talk to their child about what they're seeing and how they understand what they're seeing. That's one of the uh, um, concerns we have with the way the um, current iPad situation is with the schools is that there's a lot of viewing in isolation. And the it's great. The internet can give, show us many wonders of the world, but it can also show us many worries of the world. And I know one student I talked to had accidentally um, come across a video of uh, things that were going on in the Ukraine. 
And it was a very um, graphic video. And this young child, I remember asking like, um, was what I just watched real? And um, there wasn't an adult around at the moment mm -hmm. to contextualize it. And so that child was processing, seeing something very heavy on their own right. in, in the middle of math class. And so um, co-viewing, yes, it def definitely has advantages over children viewing things in isolation. Yeah, I feel a little better about myself then. than my <laughs> um, But no, I like to watch TV with my daughter. We watch cooking shows and, you know, all, all sorts of right. stuff like that. We watch shows where it's like, oh, look, they're making something, you know, it's interactive. I think in, in the school setting, Josh, that's that's where we've talked about the idea of transformative technology being great is because when you can use technology to do something that you can't do as a teacher, you know, or when you can do something as a parent with technology that you can't do without it. So, you know, you can definitely take your child into the kitchen and show them how to cook, but it's another level of showing them what an expert can cook or how an expert can be creative on the spot. And, you know, that's something we can do in real life, but at a different level, you can do it watching, you know, watching a show. And so it's that idea of, you know, balance and kind of taking what you can do in person and then adding to it and supplementing it, but not replacing the real in-person experience. And so I think there's wonderful opportunities for television and other things that we can learn. Yeah, technology. One of one of our IT experts says there's a big difference in creative tech versus consumer tech. Um, that's really in their line of work, what makes the difference, a big difference. So yeah. in, in addition to setting like little goals, what, what else would you say to parents? Like, how can we do this? How can we, but knowing the practical, like, you, you know, Kristen, that not every parent can do that. Not every parent, sometimes there's language issues. And sometimes some parents, particularly, culturally based they just trust the school district just you you take care of them you know like so what what advice do you have to sort of continually work on this yeah thanks for bringing that up josh um you're absolutely right many of the latino families that i serve are um very um res extremely respectful and kind um um and would never want to question um, an authority figure like, let's say, a school district. Um, they're, they are um, very respectful and they believe that the um, school district, the leaders have the best intentions and the best knowledge on these topics and they trust their children um, to that institution. And so one of the things we can do is what we're trying to do right now, which is give really good education and information to the leaders that are making the decisions that are gonna affect the most you know, amount of kids. And the school district has been very, um, they've been receptive to our, um, our um, advocacy. They've been receptive to um, hearing from us and they are willing to, um, work um, step by step making changes for a healthier uh, tech wise environment in their institution. And so um, I think education, um, getting the word out there um, and um, working together with our leaders that can make, make these kinds of changes. Yeah, it's definitely, Melissa, did you wanna add anything? I, I will. I'll give I'll give a plug to um, we are starting a TechWise community book club this summer. So we're going to be launching it next week. And so we are hoping to invite anyone and everyone to join over the course of the next year and to join in reading a book together. And if someone's too busy or, or can't um, read the book to get updates, the cliff note summary and to join in a discussion at the end of the book. Um, time period. So we're hoping to just, again, raise awareness through different avenues. So through a book club, we're, we're going to start our own uh, podcast this summer as well. And just specifically on the topic of tech and reaching out to other people in the industry um, and raising awareness on that. Um, and then, you know, we do have a in-person event we're hoping to host in the fall. We're going to partner with Village Properties and hopefully United Way as well. And so we're going to have a panel discussion. And so anyone in the community is invited to attend that because again, it's just, it's like starting with raising awareness 
And so if we educate our community and we raise awareness and we have spaces where we can have these conversations, um, you know, hopefully parents and educators alike are invited and welcome to come and they don't have to feel judged for what you currently do as a parent or as a teacher, but you can learn more about what you are doing and then you can get motivated to make some positive changes that can impact the generations in the future. Yes, well said, that there's so many families that are dealing with this in isolation and they feel um, embarrassed or shame over the issues that they have um, with their children in technology. And our society, I feel like as a general rule, likes to blame the individual or the parent um, on, on the issues, the, the problems that come out of this, instead of really recognizing that uh, um, we have to also hold um, the industry accountable. And there is a bill um, in the yep. California went through the California Senate, I think it's in the house right now, um, that is um, an effort to protect children from um, big tech that is, um, you know, designing um, apps and, and platforms that are uh, more addictive to children. It's um, California Age Appropriate Design Code Bill, AB 2273. Mm -hmm. So um, we're working at it um, at a community level here, but there's also, um, politicians um, who are working at it at a state level as well. And so um, getting also information out to families that they're not alone and that it's not something they have to have, um, you know, any shame over. It's, th this is a result of tech and um, we're all in it together and we're all here to help each other. Well, great. That's a great way to wrap up because um, you guys really just, you know, nailed it and sort of what looking ahead and in the future. And I think, Melissa, your phone's out of the bathroom thing. Like that's, <laughs> that's really huge, you know, because um, yeah, everybody's like, well, if I go in here, I can return these emails and I can't get judged. <laughs> no one's going to be like, what are you doing? And, and then, but yeah, that, that leads to, you know, two minutes, three minutes. And, you know, that's, that's a really good rule. So we're going to have to do a follow-up podcast and find out Melissa. <laughs> Did that <laughs> yeah, I'm not there yet, Melissa. So I better, that's my goal then. <laughs> you know, my other quick pointer would be, um, I did go back to a regular watch a few years ago. Oh. Um, so I don't carry my phone around. Um, and I, I do have to give the other caveat is I tried to silence my phone completely the last two weeks. And it was really a nightmare to find text messages because I took off all sound notifications. Um, and I'm not sure what my advice to other people is on that. But if, if you remove all notifications, you spend a lot of time searching for the text message that someone is supposed to, you know, anyway, yeah. so there, there's ways to simplify our life and there's ways not to. Um, and yeah. again, we're all working on that together. Yeah, I do turn off this, the notifications um, around my kids because there's nothing worse than, mm -hmm. oh, yes. hold, hold on a second. Like yes. over time, that really erodes their like, yeah. am I important to you or not? You know, yeah. and then they'll start doing it back to you when they get yeah, teenagers. Now, um, if I'm on my phone, they'll, yes. my daughter will sound the alarm. Bone zombie. And then I'm, <laughs> oh, oh, oh yes. you're right. So sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you so much, Melissa and, thank and you, Kristen. Josh. You guys are doing just a tremendous job and I appreciate you taking the time to share your really important work uh, with this audience and uh, good luck going forward. And you uh, obviously are not going to just uh, do this once and get over it. This is going to be sort of a lifelong effort that you're going to mm -hmm. be putting to this. So looking mm -hmm. forward to seeing what, everything that you're going to be doing on the future and all the progress that, that you're making. So thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Thank Josh, you. so much. Thank you. <laughs>